20 meters, we'll never get in close enough for a drop. Find another landing zone. There is no other landing zone! Hold on, everyone. We can do this. Welcome to episode 5 of Choose Wisely. In this penultimate episode, we will travel back through the trilogy, taking you with us along the same journey we took, to the point where it seems Shepard left reality behind and entered a Mass Effect universe born of a collective consciousness. We will stop at each of our primary discoveries, digging back through these suspect parts of the story that gave us pause, and inevitably led us towards what we have all been seeking, the truth. They'd rather believe in this than face the truth. These people have no idea. Did you ever wonder where it all went wrong? This is another very important question we, as players and fans, should be asking ourselves. Soon after the release of Mass Effect 3, and subsequent completion of the game by a large portion of the fan base, a very similar question was being asked. What went wrong with this story? How did Bioware mess it up so badly? The short answer, as hard as it is to hear, is nothing went wrong with the story. Once you understand the larger plots and subplots hidden within the trilogy, you may also come to accept that it ended the only way it could have. Not even the extended cut could, or should, have changed that. The only thing that will help us understand where it all went wrong is finding out where the reality of the Mass Effect universe ended, and the journey into Shepard's subconscious began. This nightmare never ends. The hell it won't. The initial episode of Choose Wisely was developed to investigate elements of indoctrination within Mass Effect. However, our primary focus and ultimate goal was always about discovering the truth. Although indoctrination is an important element to Mass Effect lore, it is not the key to separating fact and fiction within the story. It is a very well-executed misdirection. You think the indoctrination only affects prisoners? As we began our investigation, it quickly became evident that there was more to the story than what was being presented on the surface. It seemed the narrative, cinematic, and even the game mechanics were trying to tell us a very different story. Many times, through broken lore, visual effects, and dialogue, 
The game self-consciously reminded us that it was a work of fiction. Why? Now arriving at ward level purgatory. Sit back and hold on. This recap is going to be a wild ride. Wake up. We won't even start in the decision chamber, as it's not necessary. Mass Effect technology does not provide the means for teleportation of any kind. Setting aside multiplayer antics, such as Shadow Strikes and Biotic Evasion, this means the science of our beloved fictional universe precludes the entire Citadel the Return scenario. Then you will die knowing that you failed to save everything you fought for. I fight for freedom. Two possibilities exist during the run to the beam that can be considered points where reality could come to an end and illusion could begin. We'll discuss the blast from Harbinger first. Before the extended cut, this was one of the more favored places where Shepard may have been thrust into a dream state. However, there are problems with it. View Bob and screen flashing are present before this, and so are the pixelated piles of dead soldiers wearing Phoenix and Onyx armor. Water on the ground is also already flowing uphill. While creating the extended cut, Bioware must have thought it would be ironic to fix the teleporting squad members out of London issue by instead teleporting the Normandy to London in order to evacuate our injured squad mates. However, rather than solving the original issue, this scenario actually compounds the problems with the situation. Besides interference from the beam, we didn't fly there in the first place because there was a big reaper in the way. And that was just a destroyer, not Harbinger itself. Let's move further back and look at the grizzly crash. All right, everyone. This is it. This transport is never shown to be hit, but it is in a hole and on fire. Despite this, everyone gets out alive. Not one person sustained an injury. Then, everyone quickly jumps down to start the run to the beam, or so we assume based on the cutscene and narrative. However, both Anderson and Coates are nowhere to be found. It's just Shepard, Squad, and the never-ending video gamey supply of Alliance cannon fodder. There isn't even a single member of our allied forces here. Seems like a safe bet that this could be it. The place where it all goes wrong. Or does it? There are causes for concern earlier in London as well. Among them is a strange view bob that affects some shepherds and not others. This view bob can also sometimes be spotted earlier in the game. Before we go back that far, let's make one more stop in London, the Hades Cannon. Heavy weapons certainly are oddballs in Mass Effect 3. They are relatively rare and with the exception of Geth rocket troopers, they are never used against us. When we do find them, they are single use, one shot, or fixed clip throwaways. The cane we find in London, however, is the worst offender, as its behavior here completely contradicts the codex. That's it. Fire that thing right down its throat. In Mass Effect 2, this weapon functioned off generic power cells. In Mass Effect 3, its lone appearance shows it to be a one-shot guided projectile with enough payload to one-shot kill a Reaper. The Codex entry states that it should fire a slug at a quarter light speed in a straight line, similar to the main gun on Alliance ships. Compound this misbehavior with the fact that you can't seem to kill or even harm yourself with it, and we have little choice but to question reality here. This station has quite a few things wrong with it. Red, green, and blue areas representing destroy, control, and synthesis are the subtle clues, where outer hull breaches that have no effect on the integrity of the station are blatant. Of course, at the time we find the largest of these breaches, we are also supposed to be in deep, near the center of the station. Admiral, we're in deep, and the Prothean VI will be in the safest part of the station. We hovered Don't here briefly, wondering if Shepard was rendered unconscious during the crash landing into the launch bay. We also reluctantly looked at the attack in Vancouver as a starting point of the illusion. But something drastically changed our perspective. This was about the time that Turbo J insisted arrival was an illusion or hallucination. The implication would render Mass Effect 3 completely illusionary. This was a little difficult to swallow, even for us. 
but we had to stick to our guns and let the narrative do its thing. We had no idea how fast our perceptions were going to change. Arrival helped us come to an important understanding. Most of the events that take place in the Mass Effect universe are canon. Shepard's involvement in them, however, may not be. Anything directly impacted by the player, like a DLC event, is truly their story. You shall be the first to witness our arrival. Arrival was also a key point in the process of digging the wrong way. We covered the asteroid in episode 4, so we'll take a brief look at a secondary piece of evidence discovered on Eratai. Although some people like to throw around the non-canon claim where DLC is concerned, the simple truth of the matter is that if we purchase a DLC, it becomes canon in our Shepard's universe. When you blew up the Batarian relay, hundreds of thousands of Batarians died. However, even if we don't buy or play the DLC, the shit you've done, some of the events are still canon. There are a few exceptions, like Leviathan, Pinnacle Station, and Bringing Down the Sky, of course. If Shepard does not participate, the events never happen. In the case of Bringing Down the Sky, this is quite significant. If you own the DLC, but don't play it, the asteroid never hits Terra Nova. Unlike Arrival, there is no codex entry or in-game explanation as to why. Obviously, Arrival, by its optional nature, was already out as a starting point for the hallucination. But it was a gold mine of nightmare innuendo and blatant clues hidden in plain sight. Clues that call into question the reality of the events. The Reapers are coming. I know I'm not the only one having those dreams. During the first half of the mission, you have the option to go in quietly to earn an achievement. If you choose to do this, only one guard is killed by Kenson before the rest of the base is alerted to your presence. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that all of these guards could only be human, as the helmet configurations would not work for Batarians. The first time we encounter an actual Batarian is during a combat sequence. If you know anything about Batarian culture, they don't like humans. They have been at odds with humanity since it became a member race of the Citadel and began pushing colonial development in the Skillian Verge. After closing up shop on the Citadel, Batarians were reportedly very rarely seen in Citadel space, and when they did make appearances, it was usually on the wrong side of a conflict with humanity. So while Arrival was never a real consideration for the starting point of the hallucination, it did provide us with a few unrelated points of data that converge towards a simple conclusion. That being, Arrival is part of Shepard's dream or hallucination. Interestingly enough, Lair of the Shadow Broker also contains similar, unrelated clues that can help us draw the same conclusion. Playing or not playing the DLC results in a fascinating turn of events in Mass Effect 3 during the mission on the Solarium base at Sirkesh. If you have a good relationship with Rex, he knows Liara is the Shadow Broker, regardless if you play the DLC or not. You think this is the kind of thing the Shadow Broker would have known about? Too bad I don't know him. Or her. If you bring Garrus for this mission, there is some comedic banter amongst the squad about an escaped Yogg being the next Shadow Broker. Preceding this, Liara comments about fighting a Yogg if he triggered the uplift log. If Shepard is not part of the events of Lair of the Shadow Broker, however, Liara has absolutely no idea what a Yogg is. She acts as if she has never seen one before in her life. Something new to put in our memoirs. Works for me. She also never once mentions who or what the Shadow Broker was during conversations with Shepard about becoming the Shadow Broker. Simple conclusion, if a canon event didn't involve Shepard directly, then the details of the events are sketchy or non-existent. I'd hope to never see one of those again. Something new everywhere you turn. Arrival and Lair of the Shadow Broker may help us in our quest for the truth. However, due to their optional nature, they could never be considered starting points for the hallucination. To find the true beginning, you will need to find a common point of convergence that encompasses the entire player base. So what do we mean by convergence? 
We've already come far beyond the red, green, and blue convergence moment in the decision chamber. By definition, it means two or more things coming together. Consilience. Concordance. The principle that evidence from independent, unrelated sources can converge and agree on a single, strong conclusion. In entertainment, convergence can also be used to describe transmedia storytelling, also known as transmedia narrative or multi-platform storytelling, which is the technique of telling a single story or story experience across multiple platforms and formats using current digital technology. The primary form of convergence we are looking for is the point in the story before it splinters into the divergence that is our personal shepherd's journey within the Mass Effect universe, where every shepherd and player is in the same place doing the exact same thing at the same time. So now that we have a target, let's keep digging backwards through Mass Effect 2. Our next stop, the implausible trip to Wonderland. Fictional limitations within the Mass Effect universe are at the whims of the writers and must be dealt with in a reasonable fashion in order for the story to set up a given stage properly. At first glance, Mass Effect 2 seems to do this quite well for our trip to the center of the galaxy. We all know this is fiction, but even in fiction, some effort is usually made to place lore within the realm of possibility. A good writer will not overly burden the player with too much to swallow. Even in the most fantastical of tales, suspension of disbelief should come naturally, not feel forced. The Normandy taking out the Collector ship in two shots pushes this boundary to its outermost limit, as does the crash onto the surface of the base. Evidently it creates enough gravity to facilitate an appropriate crash landing. But that's not why we're here. So let's say we can actually get to the galactic core and everything is not orbiting the supermassive black hole at speeds that would test molecular cohesion. The edge of the accretion disk would be so hot it would cast off lethal levels of X-ray radiation, something Mass Effect fields don't protect against. The shielding afforded by kinetic barriers does not protect against extremes of temperature, toxins, or radiation. Even if you want to believe they can, when Normandy crashed onto the surface of the collector station, its barriers were down. So the reality of Shepard and crew making a trip to the galactic core is already on shaky ground. Let's take a look at the station. After the battle plan meeting, Shepard and half of the Dirty Dozen are shown walking away from the Normandy, jumping down into an open area that leads into the station. Except for Tally, or your own custom helmet, none of the crew is wearing protective headgear. There's oxygen here? I can understand gravity, but oxygen? The collectors don't breathe. We can barely consider them to even be organic, as most of their organs and systems were replaced by tech. They don't even have a mouth or nasal slits. No soul. Replaced by tech. Whatever they were. Gone forever. Recall the collector ship. The squad had to wear full gear here because there was no oxygen. The collectors don't need it on the ship, so it should not be needed on the station. You could argue that there may be a minor amount used in the containment areas to keep human captives alive prior to reducing them to goo. But creating a sapient-friendly oxygenated atmosphere for this entire station would be impractical and borders on the impossible, since it does not seem to be sealed against the vacuum of space. Still not convinced? Based on Javik's presence on the Geth Dreadnought, Protheans don't require oxygen either, be it to breathe or talk. It's amusing to think that Javik could survive just fine even if we threw him out the airlock. The joke is now on you, human. You will believe anything. <laughs> Did we make it to the core? Could the slip from reality be the result of traveling through the Omega-4 relay? To answer this, we need to search back through our adventure for every scrap of evidence and data that point to the contrary. The Omega-4 Relay is proposed to be a known active relay within the Omega system that only the collectors could access safely. Despite the unknown and potential threat, nobody seemed especially worried. Why wasn't collector traffic into the system monitored? 
And more importantly, why weren't collector activities monitored? The Terminus was supposedly lawless based on Mass Effect 2, but that doesn't mean those in power would be stupid. Its introduction to the player is quite matter of fact, and really, who are we to argue? The only time we've been through the Terminus systems was to pass through the Mew Relay in order to get to Ilos. It is a straightforward and blunt point that the Terminus is off-limits to anyone that wants to be in good standing with the Citadel and the Council. Inside the Terminus systems, Alliance ships are not welcome there. Neither are Spectres. In Mass Effect 1, passing through the Mew Relay is the closest we ever come to the Terminus systems, and all it does is simply give us access to the Refuge system. We see a cutscene of the Normandy entering this relay, but nothing of entering the Terminus or the FTL flight to the Mew. Our brush with the dark and scary part of the galaxy is seemingly uneventful and overshadowed by the impending business we have at Ilos. Before we move on, let's look at the introduction to Mass Effect 2's antagonist. What the hell is that? The collectors are introduced in much the same way as the Omega 4 relay and Shepard can jump out a character and out of our control here with responses that are quite jarring. I thought the collectors kept it themselves. How does Shepard know what a collector is? On a second playthrough, this answer seems plausible, as the player has enough data to roleplay Shepard as a know-it-all. However, the fact of the matter is that neither Shepard nor the player have a single shred of knowledge about what a collector is on the first playthrough. A dialogue wheel response to the contrary should not even be available until a first playthrough is completed. There are species from somewhere beyond the Omega 4 relay. There are some points of convergence here. The sudden existence of the Omega 4 relay, the collectors, and the events that take place in the galactic core. Issues that mess with our perceptions and suspension of disbelief. Perhaps they will combine with previous and future findings to help us form a conclusion about what the hell is going on with the story. The lack of gravity is a little disorienting. The dreadnought has artificial gravity. This facility has little arrow gravity. Geth require neither. I'm immune to your facts and logic. Recruitment and loyalty missions in Mass Effect 2 produce some of the best narrative and dialogue of the trilogy. The depth of conversations and scope of character development make it clear that Shepard's story is being scaled at a very personal level here. Jacob's mission is an aberration in more ways than one, and will get its own attention later. Overall, the individual stories, from recruitment to loyalty, are wonderful. However, the connection of these 12 squad members to the main plot, stopping the collectors from abducting humans on outlying colonies, is flimsy at best. Only a few of these recruits would be willing to give Shepard the time of day, never mind follow them to hell on a potential suicide mission. Yes. There are a few exceptions to this, of course. Garrus and Tally would probably join Shepard again, especially since their recruitment missions are more or less rescue missions. But what about Samara, dropping a 400-year hunt for her serial killer daughter, her self-confessed solemn duty as a Justicar, to join a mission she may not survive. Slim chance is better than none. Thane, abandoning his son once again in a second attempt to commit suicide. He had planned to die at the hands of Nasana's mercs after completing his mission. If Nasana's guards caught me afterwards, it would have been a good death. Or Jack, a psychopathic survivor who hated Cerberus with all her being, the most powerful human biotic in the galaxy, who in fact turns out to be quite underwhelming outside of cutscenes. Although Zaid and Kasumi are optional DLC squad mates, they too fall under the category of unlikely to join. They are mercenaries, out for themselves. They may play the odds, given their lines of work, but tempting fate on a one-sided scale seems unlikely. Would any amount of credits be enough if it was almost certain you wouldn't survive to spend them? No one said you could talk, jackass. So we see some small problems here in the narrative a lack of themes that could invest these characters in the main plot and bring them seamlessly into Shepard's service. So why wasn't this fixed by the writing team during the final stages of development? Is the narrative just broken, or is it trying to tell us something yet again? We don't actually have to go very far to identify the issue here. It lies just below the surface of the narrative and exposition that the game presents to us. It permeates the setting the codex, the planetary data, crying out to be heard. The important question, are we listening? No doubt, 
But you can't deny that the galaxy will be forever changed once it ends. Even I can predict how. A little humbly. But perhaps that's a good thing. Jacob is the first of the squad mates to approach Shepard regarding an issue he needs help with. His loyalty mission got our attention early on for quite a few reasons. If the beacon's been here a while, why would they wait years to signal? Pause in beacon protocol. Eight years, 237 days, seven hours. The age of its setting, coupled with thermal clip weapons and Hain Kadar mechs that were not widely used, or perhaps even in existence at the time of the Hugo Gernsback crash, were all cause for contention. Things just didn't seem right here, and Jacob seemed to draw an awful lot of negative attention to himself, both from narrative and player perspective. My father has to do with this. You have his face. He promised to call the sky, but he sends nothing. You certainly seem to have a way with words. Aia resides within the Rosetta Nebula, deep in the Terminus systems, and becomes available after Horizon. The squad lands, heads towards the crashed ship, and proceeds to get enough information to determine that the ship crashed 10 years ago and Flora is hazardous to sapiens. There are survivors, however, and Jacob's dad is among them. The implications of what happened here are horrifying, but if a player doesn't like Jacob, this mission is something of a chore, only to be completed for loyalty or power acquisition. In either scenario, both elements may be intentional distractions. They separated out the women assigned them to officers, like pets. If not preoccupied by hate or horror, many caught the use of thermal clip weapons and modern mechs here. Let's not dance around it. These elements were quite jarring. However, it is just as likely they were brushed off as game mechanics or gameplay elements. In the case of thermal clips, although we don't personally accept this excuse, it is understandable. Even if we decide to let the thermal clips slide as a gameplay element, there is no justification for the use of modern mechs in this setting. Loki mechs and YMIR mechs were Alliance exclusives. They did not become widely used outside of the Alliance military until after the battle for the Citadel in late 2183. And from our experience in Mass Effect 1, they may as well have not existed at all. Not a single human colony we visit used them to bolster defense which was their intended use. Enough with the toys. I need to look my father in the eye and hear him justify this. Commanded by Captain Ronald Taylor, the crew of Alliance survey vessel Hugo Gernsback made planetfall on the jungle world in 2173. That's not right. My father was first officer. This mission seems intent on breaking lore established earlier in the trilogy and subsequently messes with suspension of disbelief. These issues are not something the writer should have missed, given their expected knowledge of the lore, unless, of course, it was intentional. Orbital descent. I'm not unreasonable, Captain, but ten years? And given the additional discrepancy in the Codex entry on Aya, it definitely seems intentional. fantasy? I can't point to where it all went wrong. The writers can't even seem to get their own established facts and timeline for this single story arc correct. Ronald Taylor was the first officer of the Gernsback, not the captain. Furthermore, the ship crashed in 2175, not 2173. Ron was on the planet for 10 years, not 12. Perhaps Shepard still thinks it's 2183. Despite all of these little clues, there is one glaring problem with the Codex data on 2175 AEA. A problem that threatens the entire premise of Mass Effect 2. If you keep a low profile and restrict your operations to the Terminus systems, the Council is willing to offer you reinstatement as a Spectre. Shepard may suddenly have a free pass here by way of some convoluted Council politics, but the Terminus systems were off-limits right up until their death in late 2183. In 2175, humanity was a Council member species and was bound by the Citadel conventions and laws governing Council races. This included the system's alliance. They should not have been scouting worlds in the region at all, let alone planning colonization. Humanity was hard at work establishing and maintaining colonies in the Scillian Verge and Attic and Traverse, not in the off-limits Terminus systems. 
if this excursion to Aeo was an approved Alliance initiative, why wasn't a search and rescue mission launched when the Gernsback failed to report in? Did the Alliance always just abandon ships that stopped communicating? Colonial Affairs on Arcturus knew where they were going, so why no follow-up when contact with the crew was lost? Coincidentally, there was another human colony established in the same system as the Relay within the Rosetta Nebula, and it was actually founded a few years before the Gernsback was sent to Aea. The colony number is over 21 million strong. How is it that a human colony established a few years before the Gernsback disappeared never came upon this crash? Wait a minute, never mind that. For the colony on Enoch to grow so large in such a short amount of time, immigration into the region would have been at a feverish pace. The Rosetta Nebula would have had unprecedented levels of traffic through its lone relay. Attributing 30% growth to reproduction, it would still have required the migration of over 2,000 people a day, 365 days a year from the founding date to 2185. This would have been a logistical and housing nightmare and would not have been sustainable. Our adventures within the Terminus systems are widely viewed by the player base as a retcon. But what if it isn't? What if 1 plus 1 does equal 3 in this Mass Effect universe? Reach a place where 1 plus 1 equals 3. Everything would change. Maybe we should take a look at human colony data on some of the mission and loyalty planets we visit. Or maybe we should be looking at all colonial data in the Terminus systems. You may want to hold on to something, because the foundation that we built our perceptions upon, based on game lore, thematics, and the face value story throughout Mass Effect 2, is about to crumble beneath our feet. What? Consulate, do the words political shitstorm mean anything to you? This is an outrage! The Council would step in if the Geth attacked a Turian colony! Humanity was well aware of the risks when you went into the Traverse. In Mass Effect 1, it was hammered into our head that the Terminus systems were off limits. Somewhat overdramatically at times. Were we not listening? Did we forget? Or did we just accept this massive retcon to the established universe? We may as well have been in an alternate reality. Or perhaps, we already were, in a sense. So first of all, in 2183, we didn't have a single colony in the Terminus systems. That's right, you heard correctly. During the events of the first game, we had no colonies in the Terminus. However, with the exception of Eden Prime, which stood at almost 3.7 million, and Elysium, boasting 8.3 million, only half of which are human, we had but a few low population colonies in the Attic and Traverse and a few dozen modest terrestrial colonies and research outposts in the Skillion Verge. We will be dragged into a galactic confrontation over a few dozen human colonies. The Attican Traverse isn't the most stable sector of citizens. But... The Skillion Verge is the largely unsettled border region of Council space dominated by small human colonies, mainly because only humans are crazy and aggressive enough to establish them here. It was the Verge and perhaps the Traverse that were known as havens for rebels, insurrectionists, and terrorist groups within the Mass Effect 1 story not the Terminus systems. Even though the Traverse is supposed to be under Citadel protection, based on interactions with the Council, that duty seems largely left up to the Alliance. Just ask SideQuest Peddler Hackett. Got a situation here, and you're the only one that can handle it. How come every time there's a problem, you end up running to me? In the first Mass Effect, the Council claims that seeming aggression close to the borders of the Terminus could trigger a war. Looking further into human presence in the Terminus, we find a very odd picture beginning to form. If you take Elysium, Eden Prime, and even Terra Nova into consideration, the largest of the Alliance colonies in Citadel space, totaling 12 million, Alliance and non-Alliance colonization efforts in the Terminus outstrip legitimate colonial efforts in the Attic and Traverse and Skillian Verge by more than 10 to 1. Humanity has seemingly caught up to the rest of the galaxy, creating a firm foothold in this region of space. This isn't just counter to the original established lore of Mass Effect 1. It's logistically impossible. We are supposed to be the newcomers to this galactic stage. How can we have dozens of settlements and millions of people spread throughout a region of space that was off-limits to the Citadel races not two years prior? ...of the Attic and Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. Let's take a look at some of the human colonies we come across in the Terminus systems during the events of Mass Effect 2. 
IT is the home base of Project Overlord. Like the rest of the Phoenix massing cluster, the Typhon system in which IT resides was briefly considered part of Citadel space during its first wave of colonization. The colony broke off to become an independent planet in 2133. As of 2185, it had a reported human population of 1.5 million. The hell's going on around here? We already discussed Job's many logistical issues, but to add to its implausible nature, the planet actually required terraforming before it could even be settled. Although the details of this process are not available to us via planet data or codex, it stands to reason that the colony's official founding date would predate this process. This would make supporting in excess of 2,000 immigrants per day utterly impossible, as housing would likely need to be self-sustaining sealed units. Franklin is a large, lifeless moon. In order to defend Watson from the pirates of the Terminus systems, Franklin is home to two Alliance spaceports and naval bases capable of fielding six fighter squadrons each and a classified number of interplanetary ballistic missiles. The facility is capable of long-term habitation. This is a major Alliance military installation and has no business in the Terminus systems. Furthermore, despite the fighter squadrons and base personnel, a platoon of 16 Batarians were able to overtake this facility and turn the missiles against the planet they were intended to protect. What a great plan that was. Watson is the planet the facility on Franklin was intended to protect. It is known in human media for two things, spectacular tides brought on by a large moon and the bureaucratic snafu over which Earth nations got to settle there first. Watson is a garden world first discovered in 2165 CE with credit claimed by the Chinese People's Federation, the United North American States, and the European Union. The Systems Alliance brokered the infamous Rick Javik Compromise, allowing limited colonization from each coalition in cities comprised of populations from each nation. So the Alliance was brokering deals and disseminating colonization rights to planets in the Terminus system some 20 years ago, where they had no jurisdiction. Located in strategically insignificant space, Freedom's Progress Colony had once offered residents spectacular rainbows, lush marshlands, and stunning mountain ranges. Freedom's Progress is vaguely reported to be somewhere in the Terminus systems. No other data regarding its location is available. According to Mass Effect Incursion, the colony had a population of 912,810 in 2183. Even if the population remained stagnant, the time it would have taken a few hundred collectors to pod and load almost a million people onto a single ship would have taken months, if not years. Weren't the collectors supposed to be targeting small colonies so as not to attract attention? The abduction of a million people would not have resulted in hand-waving indifference from the Alliance or the Council. It should have sent waves of concern throughout Council space not seen since the Ragnar War. Anher is the single largest human colony in the galaxy. It is a human-founded and dominated world with a species combined population of 208 million. Given its founding date of 2165, this is just laughable. What is even more comical is the other dominant resident species, Terrians. The game has painstakingly expressed to us through narrative and exposition that humans and Batarians don't work together due to fighting over colonization rights in the Traverse. The civil war that took place over slavery on this world is about the only believable information we are provided. Horizon is the second human colony in the Terminus that is attacked by the Collectors. Because this world is part of the plot regarding Collector interest in Shepard and their associates, the attack is little more believable. And this is despite its population being near 700,000. How one third of that population was potted and loaded before we got there will forever be a mystery. There is a bigger issue regarding Horizon that overshadows the Collector attack, or even the awkward reintroduction of the Vermeer survivor. According to the Mass Effect 3 planet data, between the remainder of Mass Effect 2 and our return to Horizon in Mass Effect 3, the colony grew back to a minimum population of 800,000, potentially doubling in size to 1.5 million inhabitants just a few months into the Reaper War. Anyone that survived this attack would have talked about it. Personal accounts would have been all over the news, yet post-attack immigration hit an all-time high, reaching upwards of 2,500 immigrants arriving per day. 
Horizon also happens to be sporting a multi-billion credit alliance compound of an unknown purpose. This facility has subsequently been taken over and repurposed by Cerberus into a Reaper Tech testing facility, Sanctuary. Now, we already have enough compelling evidence to rule Mass Effect 3 as illusion, but it just keeps coming. Why would the Alliance build such a facility in a place they were not welcome? The theme established in Mass Effect 2 was that people moved here to get away from the Alliance. In regards to face value logistics, how would the Alliance give up such presence to Cerberus without a huge public conflict, rendering the premise of Sanctuary invalid by the thousands of witnesses living in the vicinity of the compound? Hmm, so where were the 800,000 inhabitants of this planet anyway? Now let's take a look at some of the non-human colonies we come across in the Terminus systems during the events of Mass Effect 2. Lorik is a Batarian colony within the Omega Nebula, and is an extremely rare example of a habitable world circling a red dwarf star. Originally an independent Asari colony named Eason, it was annexed by the Batarian hegemony in 1913. So the Asari did found colonies in the Terminus systems. I thought the Terminus was off limits to all council races. One more thing to note about the Omega system. The Normandy's crash site is in the Omega Nebula on a planet called Alcara in the Yamada system. This crash happened, presumably, one month after the events of Mass Effect 1. What the hell was the Normandy, commanded by a Council Spectre, doing in the Terminus systems? Invictus is a Turian colony deep in the Terminus systems founded in 1939 and has a total population of 640 million. This includes both registered and non-registered inhabitants. Oddly enough, the planet has a human Latin name which translates to unconquered. It is also the name of a human poem written by William Ernest Henley, a poem that sounds much like a personal crucible. So, the Turians don't found colonies near the borders of the Terminus. They just found them right in the heart of the region. The Turians don't found colonies on the borders of the Terminus systems, Ambassador. Talis Fia was discovered by the Asari in 385 CE. Fully funded colonization of the planet was offered to the Volus by the Citadel Council in exchange for lucrative trade agreements. As of 2185, the colony boasted a population of almost 4 billion. So it seems that the Council had no issues funding colonization efforts and conducting trade within Terminus systems as well. In Mass Effect 1, the Alliance had a difficult enough time with colonies in the Atticum Traverse, which were supposed to be under Citadel protection from being attacked by bandits and slavers. So how is it that these Terminus colonies thrive without any real protection? Let's take a look at the Mass Effect Codex entry on the Terminus systems. At least once a year, a fleet from the Terminus invades the nearby Atticum Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. Conveniently, nothing is said about how the Council races seem to go back in time to retroactively establish all these colonies that predate the off-limits status quo of 2183. In fact, the only unique species we come across in the Terminus systems is the Vorcha, and they are hardly a threat to anyone. So what are we seeing here? This all paints a picture very different from the one presented in Mass Effect 1. Almost like it's a different reality altogether. The bar for suspension of disbelief was set extraordinarily low during the opening of Mass Effect 2. Killing Shepard and bringing them back to life was an incredibly jarring sequence of events. And then of course, immediately following this impossible scenario, was Shepard's forced subjugation into the surface of Cerberus. If desensitizing the player to such ridiculous notions was put in place to lower expectations of how seriously one should take this story, it surely succeeded. The retcons that followed became the status quo rather than the exception, the most glaring of which is this retroactive colonization of the Terminus systems by the Citadel races. It's time to go back to where Mass Effect 2 all started, the Lazarus Project. A few important things happened during Shepard's escape from Lazarus that are cause for question, 
And although we have brought them up in subtle ways in previous episodes, it's time to take a hard look at these clues. Shepard brings up the fact that the gun they pick up doesn't have a thermal clip. This pistol doesn't have a thermal clip. Shepard has never seen or used a thermal clip weapon until this exact moment. How do they know the gun is missing anything? The last data pad message from Wilson expresses what most players were probably thinking. Bringing the dead back to life should have resonated through the galaxy as an astonishing human triumph, and would have changed those involved and Cerberus as a whole forever. The problem? It didn't. It's hand-waved with astonishing indifference not just by every NPC Shepard interacts with, but by the narrative itself. They seem to think you're... dead. Uh, I was only mostly dead. Try finding that option on government paperwork. After taking out the Loki mechs in what looks to be the main docking area of the base, we finally meet up with Miranda. She unnecessarily executes Wilson, who happened to be unarmed, and claims questioning him would be pointless. This was debatable, but irrelevant in the greater scheme of things. Shepard, via dialogue, can threaten not to go with Miranda and Jacob. Miranda's response to this is that the shuttle behind the doors is the last one off the station. However, this isn't actually true. Just outside the room and to the right, there are two more sitting in the hangar. When this somewhat awkward introduction to Miranda ends, and the group leaves the station, a cutscene plays showing the shuttle flying away from the Lazarus research base. It's a great visual, but also a very subtle clue that things aren't quite right here. Mass Effect 2 is our first exposure to the Kodiak drop shuttle. They are small Earth Alliance deployment craft put in service on anything larger than a frigate. The Systems Alliance UT-47 drop shuttle landing craft holds 12 soldiers in a cramped, uncomfortable cargo bay and two more in the cockpit. The SR-2 also uses them due to the increased mass over that of its predecessor. The larger ship could not easily land on most planets, unlike the truly contragravitic SR-1. These shuttles rely completely on their Mass Effect cores to offset mass. The Kodiak's thrusters are for directional use only. The core on these ships is not designed for FTL travel. Even if it were, these shuttles are not equipped with the heat diffusion systems necessary to support even the shortest of FTL jumps. The heat generated under FTL would cook everyone on board within minutes. The cutscene was cool though, right? During this impossible FTL flight to another Cerberus space station, Jacob and Miranda proceed to ask Shepard a few questions. Two of these questions reflect state of mind, based on the choices the player makes during the course of Mass Effect 1. The third tests memory, or so we assume it does. This third question is in regards to Shepard's recommendation for counselor. This question is not actually a test of Shepard's memory, however as neither Miranda nor Jacob will call Shepard out if the player's answer contradicts their actual choice in Mass Effect 1. Yes, Ambassador Udina is now Counselor Udina. Should Our choice be here, be and now, determines the Counselor. If we need thematic evidence to invalidate the meaning of this choice, we need only look at Mass Effect 3, where the impact of this choice is negated entirely, and might as well have never been presented to us in the first place. Now Counselor Anderson. I don't know how you deal with all the politics. It's a pain in the ass. As I recall, you gave me the job. But Earth was the first council world hit by all reports. Granted, this change of counselor is explained by the narrative if you actively dig for it. In the novel Mass Effect Retribution, Anderson gives up his position in order to assist Kaylee Sanders with locating Paul Grayson. It is reported in the Codex that the Alliance Parliament named Donald Udina as his successor. However, that is not in their scope of influence. They don't run the council, especially if the original council is saved. It was bad enough that Shepard's recommendation for counselor in Mass Effect 1 directly translates to who gets the job, regardless of the voting that supposedly takes place by the sitting council. But for the position to be arbitrarily passed on without council approval was for the sole purpose of hanging Udina out to dry. Coincidentally, it is implied in Lair of the Shadow Broker that we can force Donald out of politics and have them leave the Citadel altogether. However, no names are mentioned. It just happens that his picture is used on the terminal where this option is presented to the player. It is also implied by video surveillance that Anderson has ties to Cerberus. If our choice had been allowed to have Anderson and Udina switch roles in Mass Effect 3, it could have made for two very dynamic and shocking story arcs. From a story perspective, 
The irrelevance of these choices, combined with the pervasive indifference by characters to major events, seems to convey a specific intent by the writers. Their goal seems to be to desensitize us to the irrational, the absurd, and the impossible. The setting for the story was crafted with stunning detail and then deliberately and systematically torn down. If this were real life, we'd have little choice but to shrug and think, I must be dreaming. Welcome to the Purgatory, Shepard. Getting back to the opening of Mass Effect 2, we arrive at another Cerberus space station, where we have our first meeting with the Elusive Man. It is here we first learn that the human colonies are being targeted by the Collectors, and all of these colonies happen to reside in the Terminus systems. So the entire premise of Mass Effect 2 is that Shepard was brought back from the dead to stop the Collectors from abducting any more colonists and investigate a possible Reaper connection. These Terminus colonies seem to spring up out of nowhere, perhaps conjured into existence for the sole purpose of contradicting the lore established by revelations in Mass Effect 1. Or perhaps to give Shepard purpose while they try to dig themselves free of their own mind. Perhaps Shepard never woke up on Lazarus Station. Maybe they are still drifting out in the blackness of space. Commander. It would be a point of convergence, right? Shepard! Aren't we all in the same place, and wearing the same thing when the Normandy is attacked and destroyed? The only way to find out is to go back even further, into the events of Mass Effect 1, and make sure nothing within the story tells us otherwise. your choice long ago.